So, um, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Attila. I'm actually uh, working for HP. I'm working in the immersive computing group, and we deal basically with everything that is beyond uh, a mouse and keyboard office PC. So, whether it's new types of interaction, whether it's uh, uh, something that is related to gestures, touch, 3D scanning, 3D printing, or anything of the sorts, that's going to be pretty much our table. And I think that, you know, it's hard to speak about uh, 3D scanning or modeling or, or work, uh, spatial work, and not come across Blender. So uh, I think it's a, a, a good moment to explore how we can uh, introduce one to the other, so how we can get more of the Sprout functionality into Blender, and how we can uh, make, well, Sprout a richer ecosystem altogether by having Blender, uh, well, make just be a good good citizen and a, a, a good member of the, the Sprout family. Um, so uh, let's get started without further ado. How did this Sprout thing happen to be? What it is it? What is it in the first place? So just a quick check. How many of you have heard about Sprout by HP? All right. Oh, there is, and not, not today or yesterday by me. <laughs> There is still still somebody. All right, right, great, great, great. But then I guess for 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 many of you, this will be a, a maybe an interesting uh, story that how we started this uh, whole immersive workspace story. So there were different scenarios, different setups that we were experimenting with uh, in terms of the the overhead projection. So uh, basically, there is a, a projector hidden somewhere in this back of the device here, and there is a mirror system that puts the, the image uh, down, and that that creates you this this display secondary display at as a workplace. And you know there were different form factors and, and of course the, the challenges that go uh, with it and that is the difference between uh, having a, a prototype solution and something that is you know something just being in development and something that is, is ready to go mainstream. So this is actually a commercial device, something that is available for sale. It's not a prototype uh, and that's why, why the, the session is titled in, in you know as a 3D scanning for the masses because we are really going beyond this well it's somebody for somebody who is very very professional and it's not for everybody this is this is getting beyond that so you know from from very humble starts which were very very shoestring uh, we went through several iterations and you know we had a projector we had a projector we had an, a mirror and we had now a, a touch mat so this was all nice but this is really just giving a giving us an extra screen so you know is it worth uh, doing this just to get an extra screen. I can always put a, a monitor uh, next to it. I can maybe have a very, very tablet-like device in front of it. So that, that would be something also that is, is providing something similar. But actually, we want to go beyond that. So what we created is, is a, a new type of PC. So as a, as a core, it's still a, a Windows 10 device, a regular Core i7 Intel uh, CPU in there. And well, it runs pretty much any, any Windows application. Blender included, of course, and has this extra screen setup with a touch mat and a projector, which gives you a workspace. And that's uh, when I say workspace, it, it's really something that is not just an extra screen, but tries to understand what you have placed on it, what you are doing with it, and whether it's a 2D object or a 3D object, tries to make most of it and to import it into your workspace or project or anything that you might be doing with it. And the way, the way it does this is there is a, a camera array up top here. So this is not just a mirror anymore. Uh, there is a set of cameras here. So there is a uh, an Intel RealSense camera which does the 3D scanning and there is also a high resolution camera which does the, the texture capture and we also use it for document scanning uh, probably less interesting for, for Blender I think that for Blender the primary interest is, is probably textures and there's also a number of webcams if you want to just document what you are doing on the mat or, or have it as a live feed for something and well there's always the LED function at the lamp that was because we can do it. Yeah. Um, but you know, it's 2015. Uh, it's not just about hardware. You know, uh, we have gotten used to the species getting an extra core, maybe a few megahertzes, a little terabyte there and here and there. But that's a very incremental um, sort of quantitative change. We really want or think that that PC can do, uh, or that, that the whole platform can do a lot better than that. So we can we can evolve it. And there was been there was a, a lot of. Uh, development in the, for example, the mobile space, where we we see that you know people experiment with new ways of interaction or new use cases, and everything. Even though there is not necessarily you know something mobile specific about it, at the same time, 
on, on the PCs we have you know all this horsepower, all the all the uh, the good silicon there, and it's kind of getting wasted for for well you know office use and and every now and then a, a bit of render cycle. So so we went actually beyond this, and this is where the the, the Sprout software kicks in. Um, so just to add a bit on the semantic side of things, so we do um, assisted image segmentation, uh, we do the de object detection and and uh, and extraction, and also we have an API for it, so we're hoping that this uh, builds as a platform and then you can integrate it into other applications, hint, Blender, uh, so that we get most of this stuff integrated there. But this is all just, you know, words and words and words, so obviously the reason why I bothered to put this together, because there is going to be a bit of a demo. So now let's see uh, if we can, if we can get this thingy here. Okay. Sorry. Uh-huh. That's the... Ah, uh, but it's not up on the... Just a second. So, trying to get the... F I'm trying to find the screen. Which... Is it to the left? To the right. Ha! There you are. It's a bit makeshift, and I'm gonna break my neck, but I'm gonna make it work. It's a bit crude, but I think that you will see far better. Um, uh -huh, this is far as it gets, so I guess I will maybe just kind of. Uh, maybe oh, no, I yeah. can help with the mic. Yeah. I will need an extra hand, though. Great. So. Wait, oh, how many how many engineers does it take? I guess. <laughs> so um, uh, obviously, this is the, the touch mat. The projection is coming from here, and there is this little mirror, and that gives us this scan. It's a projective thing, so it's not coming from underneath it. The the touch is actually detected by the by the capacitive uh, touch screen there, so it actually sees the touches. It's not the optical thing, but rather the the mat itself that sees the the touch. So let's try and see what, what we can do here with, with the capture. Uh, I will place a couple of items on this, like that. Let's make these two. And remember I said that you know it tries to understand what's happening on the mat. So immediately when I put something on it, there is going to be a, a, a capture, and it's going to, to see what, what's happening on the, on the mat. And these are objects that I can, I can then import. I'm guessing that we have a bit of an issue with the light, because these should be actually segmented. So let me try and retake it. So, so we have a, it's a bit sensitive to lighting condition, but the idea is still that you can very easily enter your, your uh, whatever textures or information that you had there. So normally what you can end up with, and that this is what I've been doing upstairs if you have seen, is that I digitize these objects, and what you see here is why I'm not an artist, so that's what ends up when, when you draw, let me draw. But anyway, so you can see that this acts as a touch screen, uh, whatever objects you have inserted. So it's a multi-touch uh, uh, surface there, and it's pretty solid. You can bang it, scratch it, so don't cut it, but otherwise, or bend it at sharp angles, but otherwise it's, it's pretty sturdy. Obviously, you can you know, do some drawing and, and uh, some uh, interaction there as well. So you can trace, outline, do whatever you want. Now note that this is, I said, a projective surface. So if I put a paper in it, the, the image will still be underneath. I see a lot of people uh, in Blender doing tracing, so that would be also very useful. So there is no step of you know, taking a picture, a JPEG, putting it in the background, and then trace it. You can literally put on the mat whatever you want, a photo or something, and then use it as a, as a, as a working surface. And, uh, and when I say that it tries to understand what, what, it, what it sees uh, on, the, on the surface, uh, let's try this one. I wonder how it will react to the, the lighting in the, in the hall. Let's see. All right. So uh, notice that I, I didn't press any buttons. So it's aware of what's happening on the mat. There was no explicit interaction. This is what, what we call immersive. So you know, normally when you move things, you don't expect to press a button. So there is no button on the spoon or, or the fork. It's I interact with it, I don't activate it. So same thing here. So whenever I touch something, it's going to uh, process it and understand, analyze it, size it, resize it, etc. cetera. Um, uh, you, know, you can use anything you want. You know, if, if I want to make my little glove, 
I have, will have measures on it as well. So it's a vertical screen. You can see uh, the detailed measures that I got. And you know, if I move it, then obviously it's going to rescan it. Again, no buttons pressed or anything. It's just an interactive way of, of, of doing this. And this is something that I would like to see also in Blender so that you know, the, the interface is not just a pile of, of controls that I can click, but there is a more context awareness of what I'm doing so that I can do it in less clicks and less moving around. Uh, and if I put something on the mat, then let's say it can become automatically a texture uh, or, or show it or, or render it in, in some shape or form. OK, so that's the first demo. All right, but that is, uh, uh, I need to put away my little help wrap. There we go. So uh, that's, that was the first demo. But then the other part of the, the whole story that I was, I was getting at was the 3D story, right? So and now completely, something completely 3D. Um, uh, I said one of the cameras there is actually an Intel RealSense camera. What is unusual about it is that it's not forward mounted, so uh, or face mounting. So it's uh, not looking at you as a face. Most of the Intel RealSense software has been developed to track, you know, skeletal motion, face, etc. Whereas we use it to to scan objects. So it's a, a different use case scenario because it's, it's a downward facing thing. But also, uh, if you are thinking about models, it's probably more useful to be able to scan this way. Um, and you know there are very very specific solutions for 3D scanning. Some of them are more expensive than others. Some are good for you know certain types of objects. And you know the bad news is there is no silver bullet. So there is no single like 3D scanning technology that will work with every type of material, every type of object, and and all that. So unfortunately, we will have to compromise there. What we can do is that we can make this efficient. So um, HP, unfortunately, has the, the benefit of scale. So we can put a, a number of cameras there and do some sensor synthesis so that the, the texture camera, the 3D scanning camera, and all these play together so we get a very good result of, 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 of the, the scan itself, even though it's not, not you know, a, a several thousand euro uh, scanner, but rather a, a complete system for, for a lot less than that. Um, so the, the key players for the, the whole scanning experience are the, the RealSense cam. We use that for the depth, the 14 megapixel high-res camera for the textures, and of course there is a little webcam that helps you just to see what the, the camera angle is so that the object is, is uh, easier to position and, and view. And finally, there is um, the illuminator. So we also use the, the, the projector uh, in the scanning process itself. So uh, we have, this is a projected light scan. So you will see the lines uh, being projected on the object so that we get extra information about the depth and shape of the, the object that is there. And uh, there is a little accessory there. So the thing that you can see, this little box, this guy. and. The role of that is to basically move around the object and expose different sides of the, the object to the camera. So because it's a, a, a top-mounted one, this gives you a bit of an extra angle so that it goes around and sees it. Uh, it's also smart enough that you know if you do multiple scans or as it turns around, it can combine these scans. So uh, normally, you would work in cycles so that you rotate the object around and get scans from all the, the angles and sides. So sometimes with several cycles, so you, know, you scan from the scan from the top, from the left, from the right, back, front, underneath, etc. It really depends on the, the object that you are scanning of just you know how deep you want to go or how many scans you want to do, go. Um, there is always a trade-off between the resolution and the, the, the sort of the speed of the scan. So we can get near real-time readings, but then with the real-sense camera, that's going to be a very, very low resolution pixel-wise uh, scan of, of the uh, of the object itself. At the same time, if we want very high resolution, it's going to take a lot more time just to do all the cycles and all the scans. Uh, for really detailed ones, you know, expect hours basically, but then you are uh, well underneath a millimeter resolution of the, of the scan, which makes this interesting because it's uh, a fairly precise scanner in that sense. Um, 
and that's also the reason why it's a, a very stable setup or sturdy setup, because uh, you know when you are in sub millimeter, then even dirt and, and small dents or, or material on the desk can cause uh, detectable changes. So that's that's something that is getting in the way very quickly. So that's why you want to have it as sturdy as possible. People were asking me, you know, about handheld scanners. That's fine. So for you know face scans, etc., we can get away with a reasonably precise scan, but but then the moment you detach it, the, the moment there is like extra motion from your hand, from, from your body, et cetera, and it's not on a tripod or something very stable like here, then your resolution is going to suffer. Or you just basically have to average out, which is not going to help your, your results. And of course, you know, where there is 3D scanning, there is 3D printing. So, so, and when well, we talk about uh, printing, HP is not necessarily a strange name. So, um, we are also very interested in the use of this in, in terms of, of rapid prototyping. So, uh, whether it's uh, engineering use, so if different industries, of course, have different uses for it. When it's engineering, they will say that they want to um, have uh, have a model very quickly, and they want to, you know, have quick cycles have it printed in solid materials and then test it out, whether it fits, whether it serves the purpose or not. Traditionally, you would have to have somebody who is a very good uh, modeler, do the model, then they send it to a shop, then they, they machine it, they send it back, they try it out, okay, that's almost what we wanted, but not quite, we change it a bit, then we do this whole iteration again. And this usually takes several days, plus post, and then all the delays that that includes. And this way, we basically have a turnaround which can be, depending on the complexity of the object, within hours. So you can uh, start from something very simple. Let's say you take modeling clay. So don't, you don't even need to have a, a designer for the initial iterations. You just take modeling clay and scan. You, know, you make an object from, from clay, and you scan it, and you print it. So you get a plastic solid representation of, of whatever your, your shape is. We had a, a project where we uh, made a, a quadcopter that way. So literally downloaded an image from, from the internet, just made uh, the shape out of the, the, the wings and everything from clay, scanned it, and then printed it in plastics. And you know, you literally just drill the holes in there, add the engines and the control board, and off it goes. So it's, uh, in, in terms of prototyping use, it's very, very, very nifty. Of course, Blender itself is being used in, in very, very different scenarios, so I'm always keen on hearing of, on, on kind of what people use it for in terms of, of the modeling when it comes to 3D printing and um, prototyping use, so not just, just animation. And I am going to do some demos because seeing is believing, I guess, especially in 3D scanning. Let's see how much of the, there is spotlights here, which is probably not gonna help much, but, um, but uh, let's try nonetheless. Just the amount we need. Oh. All right. All right, so um, I'm actually just, because we are short on time, I'm going to do a, a, a snapshot scan. Uh, sorry. The world upside down. All right, so I'll try to move as little as I can and do the fastest possible scan here just to have been time. So you can see the structured light scan going on, but it actually uses all the the cameras that are on the device. I probably move a little bit, but then what can I do? All right, so now it has taken several snapshots with the, with the different cameras, and now it will uh, fuse these readings together and uh, create basically a, a small model. Normally, I would actually use the, the, the stage and put the object on it and then you know have a, uh, a, a scan from all the sides, but this is a single scan, which will be hopefully good enough to, to see the, uh, the, the demo or the for what we are actually getting in the scan. So this is my hand. Sorry about the hairiness, but that's how it looks like. So anyway, um, this is, as you can see, it's a fairly complete scan. So the, the sides are missing, and of course the underneath, uh, where the camera didn't see, this is what the extra passes would give me if I wanted to do the, the extra scan. I can show you what actually the real sense camera sees. So this is the, the real sense picture. Um, uh, and 
we of course capture the, the texture on top of it. So you can see plenty of detail. This is well underneath the millimeter. There are of course some artifacts because hair and, and me moving around a bit, but still we have uh, plenty of information here to create a very, very nice little model, especially if we allow for, for several scans to, to accumulate. So overall, that's the, the, the little demo for the 3D scan here that I can do in this amount of time. And what maybe I can still show you is what you would end up. So this is an actual uh, object that I scanned. Let's try to close these. A little elephant uh, that I can open. So this is what you get when you scan a, an object from multiple size and attach it. Uh, so merge or fuse these, these all these uh, renders. So then you get something that is a fairly high resolution scan with, with texture. So in this case, I, we went all the way through, so underneath, belly scan, etc. So the other tricky areas, uh, of course, between the legs, uh, behind the trunk, etc., behind the ears, which are hard to reach, so that's why you probably need extra um, uh, scan cycles, but that's the, the magic of, of 3D scanning. That, that, that's why what makes it a bit uh, maybe tricky, but something that is still worth doing, at least as a starting point for, for processing. All right. All right, and so I just have enough time to, you know, have the action, uh, the question of interoperability. So the scans that we do, we actually export in OBJ. So you can import the, the, the stuff from Blender. We, of course, capture the, the textures and the objects in JPEGs, PNGs, etc., with alpha channels. So you can import it from there. But what I want to see is uh, direct Blender integration, so that all these features would be available directly from Blender, and the paste, of course, the touch mat would, would be very nice and functional. I can start Blender already, I can put it on the touch mat, but because the controls are really meant for a keyboard and mouse setup, it doesn't get me too far. So uh, I already uh, talked with, with Julian and he had some ideas there, but uh, it's definitely something that, that needs to be uh, explored, and different areas can be used here. So one is the mat, there's obviously the 3D camera, and there's also the, the texture or high-res camera. Um, and uh, are there any ideas maybe of, of how else you would like to see this kind of hardware being used in Blender or what would you use it for? There was first and uh, Would it be possible to use it for performance capture or virtual puppetry? Yes, absolutely. We actually have a, a stop motion uh, application there, so which can merge real world objects and also captured objects. And you know, you can integrate that into Blender so that you get something there, and it's a lot easier or more, a lot more natural to do than you know on a vertical screen when you have things that you can you can move along. And I'm happy to show you the the, the, the stop motion stuff after after the session. Thank you. All right. So, so it's um, because you also said that the camera originally was designed to see your uh, face or maybe a human rig, I could imagine that if you have a, like a puppet which is recognized as a human and maybe also a face, you could do something like stop stop motion rigging. So make some poses, record them, record them, and it could be something like a yes an animation doll. Absolutely. So it's already capable enough so that it can recognize objects. So if you have markers, it already can track those. So and that's on an API level. So we have an SDK for it. So it can be integrated. So all the functionality that you have seen here is, is integratable into other applications. And with markers, sort of, they work like basically like QR codes, but they are real world markers. So you would make a capture, an image, and then mark the area. This is a, a, a part of the, the my, my sort of like point. So you don't need to have explicit markers. Parts of the object can work for that as well. And then it, as long as it's visible, it can track and record the position, and that would basically act as a puppet. Okay, and the, also the position in, in depth? Um, I mean... Um, so the, the, the object tracking doesn't give you depth, but if you are willing to go deep enough so that you combine that with the, with the real sense data, then you could get that. Okay, thank you. And you've got some three-dimensional space between the cameras and the table. Right. Is, is there a possibility to actually kind of minority report, kind of interact with objects with your right. hands up off the table? 
Right, so the, the real sense camera actually does does tracking of the sort. Um, in our experience, the, the question is, uh, so for, it's very good for actions. So if you want to start something open, save, close for that start type of things, are it's, it's detectable. So for as a, uh, if you have a limited number of, of gestures that you want to recognize, it's good. It's not nearly as good when it comes to setting values. So if I, if I have sliders, if I have something that requires an, a precise input of number of sorts, then, then of course that, that input method falls short. So you know, keep in mind what, what, what are the, the advantages of, of using gestures. It looked, so, looked like it would be a beautiful system for sculpting, for example where you could just stretch and pull and shape stuff. That's, that's the other thing that we also had uh, when, when it was exhibited upstairs, a sh short discussion on this, that currently when you, when you extrude, when you, you change and morph objects, et cetera, then you know, it's, it's really just meant for a, a one finger interaction, basically the mouse, right? You poke and then maybe you have a modifier active at the time, but it's always a one moment thing. Whereas you know, we, ha we have 10 fingers, our brains are, are very good at moving all 10 fingers in, in parallel and thinking in space. So there is no reason why we couldn't use it. So like, you know, if I use one finger, it's one strength. If I use multiple fingers or I stretch it or, or do something like this, I'm actually conveying far more information than you know, a single poke with a, with a modifier. Thank you. There was somebody here. I think it's the last question. All right. Somebody in front. Uh, just um, this is a scanner that competes with many other scanners that are now coming on the market. How do you differentiate yourself towards these other scanners? And second question linked to that, how much does this system cost? Right. So um, we are not positioning it as solely as a scanner. So we try to make or create an immersive workspace from it. So you know, just like sort of bridging the real world objects and the digital content that you're working on, so that this is a lot smoother. A lot of the the, the 3D scanners are, are you know one trick ponies. That this is what I do. I I do a scan. And that's it. We go beyond that. So whether it's interaction, whether it's digitizing, whether it's you know interaction with real world objects, blended reality applications. So it as a, an environment, it just gives you more than this one trick of being to be, do a three D scan. It can do that as well, but you know we can do far more. Uh, as for the second part of the question, for the price. Um, so nominally, it's uh, one thousand nine hundred dollars. I think that you know November, Black Friday, everything coming. It's currently one thousand six hundred, and that's actually for the the whole system. So the the scanner projector part, the Core i7 Windows 10 machine, and the touch mat. So all that together is that, and that's why it's really I, I refer to it as a as a three D for the masses because you get a reasonably powerful you know computer with discrete graphics in there, Core i7, and you get all the the sensors and cameras in there, and also the mat. So and it's not you know a stellar uh, a price, especially for professional use or, or purposes. Okay. All right. Uh, well, thank you, I guess. And uh, uh, if you have any further questions, then feel free to contact me after the, the session. Thank you.